Hi, welcome to Listen to Riches. Today, I will interpret for you the book, The Winner's Brain. In the past, we used to believe that a person's success was the result of a combination of various factors, including intelligence, living environment, economic foundation, and interpersonal relationships, among others. Additionally, luck was also considered a part of success. However, this book presents a different perspective. Every successful individual possesses a similar brain structure. They are simply better at harnessing certain characteristics of their brains, maximizing their potential, and ultimately achieving success. This book has three authors, Jeff Brown, Mark Vensky, and Lisa Nabenrin. They are all experts in psychology. We will primarily focus on Jeff Brown, a psychologist from Harvard University. He specializes in teaching people effective techniques to regulate their brains and lead positive and optimistic lives. Many of his psychological insights have been featured in renowned media outlets such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and Entrepreneur, to name a few. In The Winner's Brain, the authors conducted extensive research and analyzed numerous real-life cases to distill eight common success elements found in the brains of successful individuals. Among these, the three most crucial elements are motivation, resilience, and emotional balance. Today, we will mainly discuss how to cultivate a successful brain from these three aspects. First, let's talk about the first success element, motivation. Motivation is the internal drive that nurtures success and helps individuals face challenges. You may wonder, what is motivation and is it really that important for accomplishing something? In psychology, motivation is often considered to involve the initiation, direction, intensity, and persistence of behavior. Simply put, it is the willingness to do something. It might sound a bit abstract, but I'll give you an example to clarify. There is a Japanese author named Takashi Nakajima who wrote a book called Waking Up at 4. It tells the story of his commitment to waking up at 4 a.m. every day to work. This persistence has earned him admiration and raised questions for many people. Why does he wake up at 4 a.m. every day? This relates to the initiation and direction of motivation. Why does he persist with this behavior every day? This is the intensity of motivation. And why can he keep it up for several years? This is the persistence of motivation. In essence, all these questions can be explained by one word, motivation. You might ask again, is motivation something we generate on our own? Certainly not. Most people have experienced moments when they wake up feeling particularly energetic as if they have a surplus of drive within them and they decide to make a plan and complete tasks one by one. However, these moments don't seem to happen often. Within a month, there are not many days when we have a strong motivation to accomplish something. So, how exactly is motivation generated? The authors describe the process of motivation flowing through the brain as a three-stage process. This means that motivation doesn't suddenly appear in the mind. Rather, it is divided into three progressive stages. The first stage is the route planning phase, which can be likened to having a map while traveling. In this phase, you can identify your destination and plan your route. With this stage in place, it's like installing a GPS in your brain and your goal starts flashing in your mind. Once the destination is locked in, the brain enters the second stage of motivation, which is the ignition phase. At this point, your destination is already input into your neural GPS and you know where the finish line is, all that's left is to step on the gas. The ignition phase is akin to stepping on the gas pedal. Even though action hasn't started yet, at this point, you have a strong will and are ready to go. The final stage of motivation is the action phase, which is self-explanatory. The GPS is locked in, the tank is full, you know where you're heading, and all that's left is to embark on the journey. Returning to the example of the Japanese author who consistently wakes up at 4 a.m. every day before taking this action, he must have clearly set his goal in his mind and continuously contemplated how to achieve it and for how long he would persist. Finally, by putting this goal into practice, the positive cycle of motivation is completed. 
These three stages may sound simple, but in reality, very few people can accomplish them because completing one of them, whether it's route planning, ignition, or action, isn't difficult. The most challenging part is completing the positive cycle of motivation. The difference between the brains of successful individuals and ordinary people lies in the fact that successful individuals excel at initiating this positive cycle time and time again until they take action to achieve their goals, whereas ordinary people's brains often come to a halt somewhere along the route. For example, they might have a goal but lack the motivation or the motivation can't keep up with their actions. So, how can you complete the positive cycle of motivation? The authors introduce a method called the external rewards approach. For instance, if you want to lose weight, buy yourself a smaller size of clothing and hang it in your closet, and the more expensive, the better. This will provide you with motivation and help you transition from the ignition phase to the action phase. However, does smoothly transitioning to the action phase complete the positive cycle of motivation? Not quite. Although both are actions, there is a difference in the quality of action between successful individuals and ordinary people. For example, in an hour of reading, some people can completely immerse themselves and gain the knowledge they desire while others may spend an hour and remember nothing. So, what should you do? Successful individuals strive to achieve a state of flow as much as possible during their actions. Flow is a state of complete immersion and high engagement. In a state of flow, people may even forget the passage of time and the existence of space. You've likely experienced this yourself. When you're fully absorbed in a task, you find that time passes quickly and sometimes you even forget to eat. So, how is flow generated? Researchers believe it depends on the match between an individual's abilities and the difficulty of the challenge. Specifically, flow occurs only when abilities exceed the difficulty of the challenge. If both abilities and challenge difficulty are relatively low, even if they match, flow won't occur. Instead, it's a state of apathy, such as doing laundry for adults. To generate flow, your abilities and the challenge's difficulty should both be relatively high, and these two factors need to match. There are two possible scenarios that may arise. On one hand, if your abilities are already high, then achieving a state of flow may simply involve doing tasks that are commensurate with your abilities. On the other hand, if your abilities are lower, you will need to gradually increase the level of difficulty, starting with simpler tasks, until both your abilities and the challenge's difficulty reach higher levels to enter a state of flow. For example, if your goal is to write a book, don't just dream of seeing your work on the bookstore shelves. Instead, list all the tasks related to writing a book, talk to friends who have written books to understand the process, create an outline for your book, read similar books, and so on. By progressively achieving small goals, you may eventually reach your larger goal. Let's summarize the element of motivation. The generation of motivation involves three stages, known as the three stages of motivation, route planning, ignition, and action. Using the external rewards approach as a propellant can help transition from the ignition stage to the action stage. To achieve high quality action, focus on the process rather than the outcome to attain a state of flow and complete the positive cycle of motivation. For successful individuals, motivation alone is not enough. We often find that sometimes, despite having a strong motivation to do something, reality can be discouraging and set us back. Next, let's discuss another crucial element of success that successful individuals need when external circumstances deal them a blow, resilience. Everyone's life is filled with various adversities, setbacks, and challenges. But why do some people crumble in the face of difficulties while others can withstand countless hardships without flinching or wavering? The answer lies in the latter group's possession of resilience. So, what exactly is resilience? In psychology, resilience is defined as the ability to bounce back in adverse conditions, adapt to changes, cope with stress, recover from adversity, and maintain a normal life. 
Think of it as a spring. No matter how much pressure the outside world exerts, this ability has the strength to return you to your original state. Successful individuals have a reservoir of resilience in their brains, allowing them to get up one more time than others after a fall. The book recounts a true story that once made headlines across the United States. In 1989, a young girl named Teresa Mayhe was out jogging in Central Park when something dreadful happened. While crossing the park, she was brutally attacked and sexually assaulted, losing 75% of her blood and suffering severe head injuries, almost costing her life. She was later discovered by a Good Samaritan and rushed to the hospital. Despite the bleak chances of survival, she eventually emerged from a coma and mental confusion. If such an incident had happened to someone else, it might have cast a shadow of fear over their entire life. But not Mayhi. She successfully emerged from a deadly blow, returned to a normal life with immense resilience, and eventually became an inspirational speaker. When life delivers a severe blow, two outcomes typically occur. The first is being overwhelmed by the disaster, unable to recover. The second is a different kind of person who does not let external circumstances disrupt their choices. No matter how significant the setback, they can swiftly recover, just like Mayhi did in the story. But what gives them this resilience? The authors introduce a concept called the locus of control, which relates to how individuals attribute good and bad events in their lives. In essence, at this critical juncture, you have two choices. The first is to attribute all your experiences to external factors, known as an external locus of control. External locus individuals believe that events happen because of external forces like the environment, other people, or fate, and they believe their own agency is limited. In contrast, there's the internal locus of control. Individuals with this trait believe they can control their own destinies and do not attribute outcomes to external circumstances. The authors suggest that those with an internal locus of control tend to have more resilience, freeing themselves from failure and building the motivation to face more significant challenges. You might wonder, what if someone has an external locus of control? Does that mean they will always remain defeated after a failure? The authors suggest that if you have an external locus of control, you can change your worldview by completing small tasks. For example, if you lose your job, you can either wait for job opportunities to come to you or proactively submit your resume to potential employers. Similarly, if you are in a failing marriage, you can choose between arguing and complaining or actively addressing the troubled relationship and starting anew. In short, in these small choices, deliberately try to opt for positive methods to complete them. Once you gain confidence in controlling small matters, you can tackle more significant challenges in life with a more responsible attitude. In addition to changing your worldview regarding small matters, the author also introduces a method for nurturing resilience called finding role models for coping with failure. In simpler terms, it involves observing how others handle failure. When faced with adverse situations, you can ask yourself, what would my favorite professor, boss, idol, or friend do? Then, imagine you are them and use their thoughts and coping resources to help yourself through the toughest times. While this method might seem somewhat impractical, it has proven to be highly effective because our brain contains mirror neurons specifically responsible for imitating others, aiding in better understanding their behavior, intentions, and emotions, and using the strength of others to aid in your own recovery. Now, let's summarize the key element of resilience. In this section, we've discussed the crucial role of resilience when facing difficulties in life, as well as the distinct choices made by individuals with internal and external loci of control at the control point. For individuals with an external locus, gaining confidence through completing small tasks is a method to change their worldview. Alternatively, they can emulate their role models using their thoughts and coping resources to aid in their own recovery. We understand that to overcome significant traumas, resilience is crucial, but equally important is the power of emotions. Whether you are going through a troubled divorce or have suddenly lost your job, your emotions can enhance your resilience. 
The third common factor in the brains of successful individuals is emotional balance. We often notice that successful individuals appear to be perpetually motivated, efficiently managing their time to achieve their goals, while ordinary people tend to be more lazy or unproductive. Apart from the factors related to motivation, emotions play a significant role in this difference. For each situation, there exists an optimal emotional state and level. Successful individuals can consistently bring their emotions to the most favorable state for a given task, and there is a pattern between emotional arousal levels and task performance. In psychology, this pattern is known as the yerkes dotson Law, named after two Harvard psychologists who first discovered this relationship and hence honored with this law. So, what is emotional arousal level? It represents the level of stress metabolism in your body, in simple terms, how pumped up you are. The emotional arousal level is closely related to one's emotional state. Imagine that when a person is extremely fearful or elated, their emotional arousal level naturally spikes, making them unable to sleep and restless. Conversely, when a person is mildly sad or content, their emotional arousal level is relatively low, which is also not conducive to task completion. According to the yerkes dotson Law, every activity has an optimal emotional arousal state. If the emotional arousal is too low or too intense, work efficiency will decline. This might be a bit challenging to understand, so let's illustrate it graphically, giving you a more intuitive idea. Imagine a Cartesian coordinate system where the horizontal axis represents the degree of emotional arousal and the vertical axis represents task performance. The relationship between them isn't linear but rather resembles an inverted U-shaped curve, suggesting that when emotional arousal is moderate, task performance reaches its peak. Once your emotional arousal level exceeds this point, it can hinder task completion. For example, there's an idiom called let success go to one's head, which actually refers to this law. When someone is excessively elated, their emotional arousal level is high, but their task performance can be compromised, leading to mistakes. This law can also explain why some children perform excellently in everyday studies but underperform in exams. High emotional arousal during exams caused by anxiety and tension disrupts memory and cognitive processes, reducing efficiency. So, even if they excel in everyday studies, they struggle to perform at their actual level during exams. However, maintaining an extremely low emotional arousal level is also not ideal. In certain situations, you need to be a bit excited. So, when should you raise your emotional arousal level, and when should you keep it low? The author suggests it depends on the task's difficulty. For easy or straightforward tasks, a higher emotional arousal level is beneficial. For challenging or complex tasks, a lower emotional arousal level is best. A moderate emotional arousal level is most suitable for tasks of medium difficulty. What defines a task as easy or difficult? There's no one-size-fits-all answer, it depends on your own mastery of the task. For instance, if you rarely participate in job interviews, interviewing might be a challenging task for you. In this case, a lower emotional arousal level, a state of relaxation and composure, will help you perform better. In contrast, compared to interviews, creating a resume is a simple and straightforward task. In this case, you should proactively raise your emotional arousal level slightly to approach it with more focus and attention, ultimately resulting in a better quality resume. In summary, the key is to assess the difficulty of tasks based on your abilities, pay extra attention to small matters, be mindful of regular tasks, and ease your mind for significant endeavors. So, if we want to emulate the brains of successful individuals, the first thing to learn is to regulate our emotional arousal level. Determine whether it should be higher or lower based on your actual abilities and the relative difficulty of your goals. So, what should you do exactly? First, you need to learn self-awareness. The author suggests keeping an emotion journal for one to two weeks to identify your emotional response range. Rate your emotions on a scale of 0 to 10 before bedtime each day. 
Assign a 10 for exceptionally joyful and 0 for extremely downcast emotions, adjusting based on intensity. Plot these emotional points on a graph, connecting them over two weeks. This way, you'll have a clearer understanding of your emotional baseline and the range of your emotional fluctuations. You'll also see what events trigger heightened emotions and what causes emotional lows. Next, try to determine which emotions you are more inclined to express and which ones are difficult for you to convey. Are you better at expressing happiness or sadness, satisfaction or anger, for example? Once you grasp the patterns of your emotional fluctuations, you'll find it easier to adjust your emotional arousal level during critical moments, aiming for your optimal state. At this point, you might wonder, what if, after recording your emotions for two weeks, you find that your emotional state is consistently low? After understanding your emotional state, how should you manage your emotions? The book provides an effective method called the desk file technique to manage emotions. The term desk file is quite intuitive. Imagine a cluttered desk piled high with various documents. In this situation, you use a desk file to separate these documents from your current task. This action helps alleviate the stress and anxiety you might be feeling. You might say this is just a way to avoid facing problems, but it's not. The desk file technique isn't about avoiding problems, it's about using your current task as a desk file to separate the past and the future, focusing solely on the present. After you complete the current task, you can remove the desk file and address other matters. For example, during the 1996 Olympics, American gymnast Carrie Strug injured her ankle during the first vault attempt. The audience audibly gasped, expressing concern for her. However, Strug didn't get absorbed in the situation at the time. Instead, she mentally set up a desk file, keeping all the pressure and anxiety outside. She focused solely on a manageable task, executing the technique for her second vault. She said, I didn't hear the audience's reaction, nor did I think about my ankle or what my success or failure meant. I only concentrated on my performance. Ultimately, she successfully executed her second vault despite the injury, helping the U.S. gymnastics team secure the gold medal. So, when you feel overwhelmed by stress or extreme anxiety, you can create a mental desk file for those concerns, allowing yourself to concentrate solely on manageable tasks. After completing a controllable task, your emotional arousal level will tend to rise, making it easier to tackle other responsibilities. In this section regarding emotional balance, we discussed the Yerkes-Dotson Law, which emphasizes the disadvantage of emotional arousal levels being too high or too low for task completion. By recording an emotion journal, we can understand ourselves better, finding our optimal emotional state and emotional quantity. When emotions become uncontrollable, setting a mental desk file in our minds helps us concentrate on tasks that can be controlled. After completing such tasks, our emotional arousal levels rise, making it easier to approach other tasks. Finally, let's summarize the entire book. We introduced three main success factors in the brains of successful individuals. The first is motivation, which involves three stages, path planning, inspiration, and execution. Using external rewards and the new flow method helps us transition from inspiration to execution. The second is resilience, and we discussed how individuals with internal and external loci of control respond differently at the control point. For those with an external locus, they can cultivate resilience by changing their worldview through completing small tasks and by emulating role models, utilizing their thoughts and resources. The third factor is emotional balance, and we've learned about the Yerkes-Dotson Law, understanding the importance of adjusting our emotional arousal level. In addition to these three primary success factors, the author introduced five other success factors in the book, self-awareness, focus, memory, adaptability, and caring for the brain. The author believes that through conscious practice, we can change the neural connections in our brains, making our brains more proactive and helping us achieve success. That concludes today's content. Congratulations on completing another book. Thank you for your support and attention. 
please subscribe to the channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom with practicality to achieve our financial goals and create a better future. Thank you, everyone. See you next time.